Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the GPE webinar series. Uh, my name is Stuart Cameron. I am uh, I work on equity and inclusion at the Global Partnership for Education, um, and I am joining from my home near the GPE Secretariat in Washington D.C. And we're also joined online by a wonderful panel of experts who are going to be uh, presenting today. GPE's webinar started in 2016. They're part of GPE's Knowledge and Innovation Exchange Initiative that came about as a response to GPE's partner countries' requests for additional opportunities to exchange knowledge, good practice, and policy approaches that inform education policies and practices at the country level. The webinar also gives practitioners the opportunity to engage in a continuous practice of knowledge exchange between partner countries, which in turn strengthens and fulfills the national and global objectives of GPE. Uh, now, this particular webinar is the sixth in a series focusing on collecting and using data on marginalized groups for education. This series is tackling issues such as how to identify disability and measure inclusive learning environments, the role of community and citizen-led in initiatives, and the use and limitations of new technologies in gathering better data. Our aim is to convene key partners working on these issues and foster collaborations that can hone and apply new ideas. Before we begin this session, I'd like to draw attention to a few housekeeping items. Um, firstly, if you're facing any connection issues, please let us know via email at webinars at globalpartnership.org. Uh, we will have a question and answer session after the presentations. So feel free to keep sending your questions throughout the webinar via the YouTube live chat feature, or you can also send your questions by email to the same address, webinars at globalpartnership.org. We will try to get as many questions as possible during the question and answer session. Please do let us know your name, your organization, and the name of the presenter or speaker to whom the question is directed. The session is also being recorded. We will send everyone participating today resources associated with the webinar and a link to the recorded session. Um, and please make sure that you click on the registration link that was in the email invitation if you haven't already and if you want to receive those resources. We have live captions or subtitles in English for today's session. Um, and you should be able to see the link to the page where you can watch the video, the same video with live captions underneath, and that's in the comments box on the YouTube page. So today's session is about assessing learning in places that are affected by conflict and other crises. This is of particular importance for GPE because almost half of GPE's partner countries are affected by conflict and fragility, and 60% of GPE funding is allocated to those contexts. GPE supports countries as they emerge from crisis tr through transitional education planning and providing flexible and accelerated funding for rapid support to countries in urgent need. GPE also works with partners, including UNHCR and Education Cannot Wait, to ensure that support during crises is complementary and to facilitate dialogue between development and humanitarian actors. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, GPE is supporting countries with a $500 million accelerated funding window to ensure continuity of learning uh, with 10 grants that have been approved now and a further 40 which are under review. Now, we know that many children remain out of school or don't complete basic education in emergency settings. And we believe that even if they're in school, they'll often have difficulty accessing uh, a good quality education. However, we don't know enough about how much children are learning in these contexts because learning is not always rigorously assessed. GPE monitors the quality of learning assessment systems in its partner countries, and there has been progress in this area. Um, but in 2018, still only 36% of fragile and conflict affected countries had learning assist assessment systems in place that met quality standards. All of GPE's grants to fragile and conflict affected countries include support to learning assessments, um, supporting, for example, early grade reading and maths assessment in Cote d'Ivoire and national learning assessments in primary grades in Liberia and Sudan. So today's webinar focuses on initiatives uh, in different countries that try to fill this data gap by assessing learning as well as other aspects of education in conflict affected situations and feed that information back into better and more inclusive programs. And we're very grateful to INEE, the Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies, which initiated some of this work as part of its efforts to create a shared understanding of equitable quality learning outcomes and measurement of quality 
learning outcomes across human, humanitarian and development education programs. Now, uh, allow me to introduce uh, to you our presenters and discussants today. Uh, Alison Krupa is a senior specialist in learning research at Save the Children USA. Her work focuses on education for violence, conflict, migration, and displacement affected populations. She is an adjunct at American University where she teaches research and evaluation methodology. She holds a PhD in lifelong learning and comparative international education from Pennsylvania State University. James Campbell is a policy and advocacy specialist at Save the Children USA. His interests focus on forced displacement, human rights, and international organizations. Um, prior to this, he has served in the UN General Assembly, Save the Children International, Amnesty International, Physicians for Human Rights, uh, and the Institute for International Education, to name a few. Tarek Daud is a Monitoring, Evaluation, Accountability, and Learning Manager at Save the Children International, uh, their Lebanon country office. He is a postgraduate of the American University of Beirut and is currently a second year doctorate student at the Université Côte d'Azur, Nice, France. Helena Pilvainen is a Senior Education Program Specialist at United Nations uh, Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, or UNRWA, and based in Jordan. Um, prior to her current role, she has served in the Queen Rania Foundation for Education and Development in the U.S. education nonprofit sector and as an education pioneer graduate fellow at the uh, New York City Department of Education. Fouad Jadala is the head of the Monitoring Research and MS Unit at UNRWA based in Jordan. He has 27 years of experience in education and has previously also held posts at the International Labor Office and the International Youth Foundation. Mohamed Salama works for UNRWA in the West Bank as Deputy Chief Field Education Program, where he leads the education program and implements uh, policies aimed at improving quality of education in UNRWA schools and was previously Head of Professional Development and Curriculum in UNRWA. Kate Anderson is the founder of Unbounded Associates, a group that aims to foster better collaboration between the thinking and doing in global education and has previously worked at the Brookings Institution as technical lead for the Learning Metrics Task Force and in research and evaluation of early childhood education programs in the US. And uh, Anne Smiley is Associate Director of Research and Evaluation with FHI 360's Global Education, Employment and Engagement Business Unit. Dr. Smiley is also a technical lead for education in emergencies and leads monitoring, evaluation, research and data activities for FHI 360. 360's EIE programs. She also leads the INEE Data and Evidence Collabor Collaborative and the Monitoring and Evaluation Workstream, and co-leads the Education Equity Research Initiative, which is a global forum for generating evidence around equity and education programs. So uh, with that, I will hand over to Kate Anderson, who's gonna be our first presenter today. And she's presenting on the, um, her, um, report on mapping of assessment um, of academic learning outcomes in education and emergencies. So, Kate. Kate, I don't think we can hear you. How was that? That's better, thank you. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, great to, to be able to um, talk with you today. Um, I'm gonna be sharing a project that, um, a mapping project I worked on um, commissioned by INEE with my colleagues, Lindsay Reed and Elena Lozada. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I've, I have to advance the slides on my phone, so forgive a little delay here. Um, so I'll tell you about the background and the methodology of the study that we did, um, which uh, ended in March of this year. 
the measurement tools that we examined, the global guidance documents that we looked at, um, the academic domains and what we found about which um, academic learning domains were contained in the measurement tools and guidance documents. And then at the end, just kind of talk about the findings and how they relate to um, some of the current situations. So as far as the background and methodology, this was um, initiated by the INEE Education Policy Working Group. Um, and the, it's the Quality and Equitable Learning Outcomes work stream. And really the goal was to create shared understanding of equitable quality or learning outcomes and measurement across humanitarian and development education programs. Um, it's really important to note that the um, INEE commissioned two separate mapping exercises, one on academic that we completed and one on social and emotional learning, which was done by the EASL lab at Harvard. Um, the reason why they split up this exercise was because the nature of the tools um, and, and the guidance documents tends to some focus on academic learning outcomes, such as literacy and numeracy, Others focus on social and emotional learning. There's some integration, and I think the, the colleagues we'll hear from later today are, are kind of at the cutting edge of integrating those tools, but, um, but found that um, really, you know, the, um, the structures that we're working within tend to separate um, these concepts. And so that's why the mapping exercises were conducted separately. Um, I'm going to send a, a link around um, and please do take a look at the full reports and the tools for both the um, social emotional learning and the academic. So um, first, just some key challenges to measuring learning in humanitarian context specifically. Um, I know there's quite a bit of challenges to measuring learning. Um, in any country and in, in low and middle income countries, especially, but there's some extra. Um, challenges in humanitarian context. Um, one is that the existing assessment systems are not necessarily set up to capture populations on the move um, or cannot respond to the additional strain. So we, we found that um, there were quite a few studies, some regional assessments, some um, national assessments of early grade reading where if there was a, a part of the country that was engaged in conflict or crisis, that would be um, either not sampled in the beginning of the study or um, removed in subsequent administrations of an assessment, um, many times for the safety of the enumerators. And so um, we're really um, excluding populations um, that we, those of us on this webinar care most about um, just by the systems that, that have been set up. Um, there's also parallel systems of education, which amplify the confusion on what to assess, um, when and how um, some populations might get assessed too much and some not at all, um, which still doesn't provide a, a good picture of learning outcomes. Um, national governments, um, especially those in countries affected by conflict and crisis, um, see this as a very low priority when um, education provision is, is a challenge at all. Um, there's also some extreme cases where the host country and the country of origin do not allow their national curricula to be used with refugee children, um, for example, with the Rohingya children in, in Bangladesh and Myanmar, um, that um, there's, there's kind of um, not even a clear um, curriculum to be used, and, and many humanitarian actors have stepped in to um, try to fill the space, but it still doesn't take the place of a, of a state-supported um, curriculum. And then um, children and youth being faced by conflict and crisis, um, they, they face cognitive loads far beyond their peers, which just make assessment, you know, could add to the stress of it. Even if, if you're using tools that are kind of lighter touch and, and take less time and are child friendly, um, it still is, it could be stressful and add to the existing stress. So we, we took a look at 30 measurement tools um, where the approach was used in at least two countries. So we know that there are um, hundreds, thousands of assessments of, of literacy and numeracy used around the world um, for the sake of kind of looking at where there's commonalities across countries and, and countries affected by conflict and crisis. We looked at those that were used in more than one country um, and in countries af um, affected by conflict and crisis. And I'll, I'll talk about um, which ones those are. And I'm sorry, this, this slide isn't, um, you can't see everything on here, but um, we also looked at guidance documents. So kind of large policy documents that signal uh, what learning outcomes should be assessed. 
um, and program approaches from, from organizations that um, were used in at least one country affected by conflict and crisis. And I'm not gonna go into detail on those because that's what the, the colleagues in later presentations will be covering. Um, on the next slide, these are the countries that we included. It was 61 countries. Um, we, uh, we basically took a look at, at several um, lists of, of conflict affected countries. So this isn't a um, necessarily a um, kind of global list. This was the list we used for this study. We looked at the UNHCR refugee situations list, um, the humanitarian's operation list, and then took additional suggestions from INEE members. Um, on countries that were of interest. Um, so that's how we got to the 61 countries and they're all in the, the main report. So here's what we found um, about the tools that we use. We looked from early childhood um, through late primary. And um, again, my um, the, the full graphic is not showing up here. So there's things missing, but you can see this in the report. Um, and um, basically that they, they covered a wide age and grade range of these 30 tools. Um, one of the questions is we wanted to know what information do they capture on background and context? So um, all of the measurement tools uh, collect at least some information on characteristics like gender, socioeconomic status, language, and education levels of the children. Um, some also collect information on what opportunities students have to learn outside of school or household characteristics, um, scare characteristics of the school, village and community. Um, some of the regional assessments and international assessments have background questionnaires for parents, uh, teachers and principals that are administered alongside the learning assessments. And um, while those are kind of formally part of the assessment package, we know that there's a lot of um, organizations that have administered additional supplemental surveys alongside a tool um, to, to combine them to serve the same function many times. Um, the last point around um, refugee IDP or stateless person status, um, these are not, we didn't find any instances where these were collected um, with the tools in the information we reviewed. And, and really only recently have there been efforts to, to gain consensus on, um, on how to measure um, and, and capture this information in a way that's, um, that's supportive and, and not stigmatizing. Um, okay. Um, as far as validity and reliability, we really saw a range. Um, all of the measurement tools have been designed and piloted to determine some psychometric standards of validity and reliability. Um, and, and many of them in low and middle income countries and, and a few in conflict affected um, and crisis situations. So um, there, um, and, and many of them that have not, have at least been based on tools that have um, been validated and, and validated in, in, um, in low and middle income countries. Um, so the, the main thing here is that there are quite a lot of tools to build on. And even if they're not currently in use, um, there's some really good models and data in organizations um, that you'll hear from after me, you know, um, have quite a bit of expertise and there's, there's a lot to build on. Um, there, the costs really range. It was hard for us to answer the question on cost. Um, because there's some open source tools that are available, but of course, administration costs um, can really vary by country. Um, again, when you're looking at um, sections of, of a country that are um, difficult or impossible to access due to conflict or crisis, um, it makes administration difficult. Um, the regional assessments have, um, and some of the international assessments require countries to pay participation fees, which, um, which go toward development and design of the tools and, and all of the um, statistical work may, uh, necessary to make them internationally comparable. Um, and the test administration represents about half the total cost and um, institutional costs are around 25%. Um, and in, in countries, in, in assessments where there's that additional international fee, that's, that's an additional 25%. So just, I'm gonna quickly talk about the guidance documents that we, we found um, most uh, relevant. We looked at eight different guidance documents and really found, um, and guidance documents are things like the SDGs, the INEE minimum standards, um, regional 
um, guidance. Um, and we found that really the, the clearest guidance um, that, that we have on, on what to measure um, regarding academic outcomes is in the SDGs and many of the regional um, and national plans kind of um, have um, aligned themselves with this. And in the SDGs themselves, there's not a common definition of, of what we should be measuring, what the constructs and minimum proficiencies are, but the UIS um, has been tasked with developing standards and guidance for this. Um, so we do have minimum proficiency standards now and um, an SDG 4.5 um, requires the disaggregation on multiple equity indicators, including conflict affected. Um, I, we, we haven't seen evidence so far that, that that's happening, but it, it's part, there, part of it and it's in the, um, in the framework. So um, as far as collecting um, information on education and emergencies, the INEE minimum standards are the main reference points. Um, they are referenced in um, in other frameworks, but they don't. They're very very broad and supportive, and don't recommend, um, require, or align to specific assessment tools. Um, so what we learned basically from the guidance documents is that it's really um, um, not. They don't provide um, the level of detailed information for countries um, to be able to make decisions on on how to measure learning, um, and and it really needs to come down to the needs of the country. Um, with some additional guidance that, that's provided um, by organizations like UIS. Um, I know that I don't have um, a lot of time left, so um, this is all in the in the report, but we really, we looked at what are the specific competencies that the tools are covering using a coding scheme developed by UNESCO, IBE, and UIS. Um, and and just a quick kind of um, show of where the the tools um, what they cover. So um, domains like uh, in reading, decoding, and comprehension. Um, decoding is is covered in quite a few tools. Um, comprehension in in some as well. Um, some of the the broader skills in in the literacy domain like listening and speaking and writing. Um, are, are not, don't tend to be covered. But um, the, the good news is that there is quite a lot of overlap in what the tools cover. Um, and, and these um, are looking both at these multi-country tools, but also ones that um, are, um, that, that are in national um, learning assessments based on UNESCO's analysis. Um, and um, going to the mathematics domain, um, this is something where we found a very clear pattern around number knowledge and operations. Um, and um, that was in pretty much every single um, assessment that we looked at. Um, but if you look at the broader set of, um, of skills in, in the mathematics domain, <clears throat> problem solving, reasoning, um, these are not, don't have as much coverage in these assessments. So um, just a, a quick summary of, of what we learned. Um, so are children affected by conflict and crisis included in assessments of academic learning? Um, we were not really able to answer this question um, fully because the majority of learning assessments do not gather the information um, on, on the status. Um, we know that many do not construct a sample to ensure inclusion of refugees, IDPs, or stateless people. And um, most learning assessments are conducted in schools with some in homes. So um, if children are not um, or out of school um, and they're, you know, um, they're not in a home that's in the sample, um, they're like unlikely to be included in a study. And um, even if they are in government schools, it's possible that those schools have been excluded um, if there's um, if there's an emergency setting, uh, emergency happening in their region of the country. Um, so um, conclusions, not surprisingly, measuring learning is challenging, and especially in education in emergency contexts. Um, just transplanting assessments used in other contexts, um, they it, it doesn't it needs they need more um, work to adapt and make them contextually valid and capture the external factors. Um, there's um, a potential for the guidance documents and and measurement tools to um, 
increase equity for children in conflict affected and fragile contexts. So the tools are there, um, governments are using them, and um, it really comes down to a commitment to, um, to be proactive about using these to capture the most vulnerable children. Um, the guidance documents don't provide robust details um, or specifics, which could, um, could be an opportunity as well. And, um, and as we said, only of the 30 tools examined, only three were developed specifically for education in, in emergencies. And we're hearing from two of those in, in later presentations. Um, and again, there's some common domains to build upon. Um, and just a couple of notes on this. This was written before the COVID-19 global crisis. Um, so we know that um, for the one in four children around the world already affected by conflict and crisis, now they're experiencing a double emergency brought upon by COVID-19. So um, if they were excluded before, um, there's it's likely that nothing has changed and, and it has gotten worse. Um, so we, um, you know, there's an opportunity here um, as we build back better to ensure that um, children affected by conflict and crisis are included in data for decision making. Um, there's a lot of efforts now to try to get um, information remotely via telephone um, and and via other, you know, other um, mediums. So if we are able to do that now during COVID, um, there should be a way to apply that going forward um, so that we we are able to include all children in, in decision making. Thank you. Um, Sorry about that, everyone. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Alison, James, and Tarek for our second presentation on Save the Children's Return to Learning program. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, so this presentation is going to focus on our Return to Learning program that uses the Holistic Assessment of Learning and Development Outcomes, or HALDO, which Kate just referenced in the previous presentation, and how the Return to Learning program is designed to support data-driven programming in education and emergencies. We're going to talk about what Return to Learning is, how the program is designed to use data, how we measure Return to Learning, and what our results are telling us, and how we use that data in programming. And finally, how that data informs advocacy and policy making. So using Return to Learning as a case study, we can see how one program designed to be deployed in emergency and refugee environments, particularly in the rapid onset of displacement, can use data to inform uh, programming and policy. When children are displaced, particularly immediately after displacement, they have missed out on months, if not years, of schooling. Return to Learning is designed to fill that gap in educational access by supporting children to return to school, both through enhancing school readiness, supporting skill building, and providing children learning content while program implementers and policymakers identify where children can integrate into longer edu longer term educational programs like formal schools, non-formal programs. Return to Learning includes a short program implementation to identify and support out of school children. Um, and it's a six week program uh, that provides game-based learning content primarily focused on social and emotional learning and including literacy and numeracy activities to help out of school children return to the learning environment. It was specifically designed and uh, to be implemented in child-friendly spaces, temporary learning spaces, or transit centers. And the learning content is lightweight and flexible, so it can be implemented by facilitators with a variety of backgrounds who maybe were never trained as teachers. We target uh, ages four through 12, and this presentation is going to be speaking broadly to the Return to Learning program design, showing, on how, showing how the program um, uses data-driven decision-making in one case. We built data-driven decision-making into the program design to help support program implementation, both by training facilitators to identify children's learning needs through HALDO, um, and by uh, supporting 
a flexible design to use nationally relevant learning measures um, and to build the evidence base for improved and targeted investment policies and responses to support displaced children's learning needs nationally and globally. Uh, in terms of program design, return to learning includes data collection through focus groups with facilitators implementing learning content in the classroom, classroom observations to identify where facilitators may need more support or resources, and identifying children's learning needs using HALDO. So we developed HALDO because while over the last decade, learning assessments have become more common in low and middle income countries such as EGRA, ESA, IDELA, um, which Kate just discussed, uh, this evidence-based revolution has yet to influence education programming in situations of conflict and forced displacement. Aldo is a direct child assessment that measures literacy, numeracy, and emotional learning, and includes contextualized demographic information, such as socioeconomic status measured by uh, household items, a children's mother tongue, uh, the Washington group short set on disability, refugee status, and other questions that are adapted in each instance. In the Return to Learning program, uh, HALDO can be used as a needs assessment and a program evaluation tool. It helps facilitators and program implementers identify children's emergent, foundational, and intermediate and advanced skills measured by the tool. And we created thresholds for these categories based on children's responses um, in HALDO in uh, each context. Although it's not an individual diagnostic or school readiness assessment, although the social and emotional learning, literacy and numeracy domains map well to school readiness assessments in the literature, it does show us general skills that are often measured in school readiness measures. And with this in mind, the return to learning results are going to focus both on the qualitative data and results from HALDO to help us understand implementation. After the short uh, return to learning inter intervention, the program is really designed to identify longer term programs, both formal and non formal, for children to integrate into. These programs would be measured by existing formal and non formal learning assessments already built where possible. So, HALDO is not meant to replace any national assessments um, that are currently in use. Aspects of uh, return to learning have been implemented in uh, the Balkans, Spain, Kenya, Uganda, and Lebanon, with plans for contextualized implementation in many other locations. Uh, these results here highlight only one pilot of return to learning that used the full qualitative and quantitative data collection plan. Uh, we found that HALDO was reliably and consistently measuring the same concepts and the uh, expected increases in scores by age. We are currently working on a more detailed psychometric analysis of the tool that would be forthcoming. We also measured change over time in this pilot and found that although the intervention was short, there were significant increases in learning and well being outcome scores associated with participation in the program. Finally, the integration into longer term programming was tested with children in an early childhood programming, uh, ages four to six, and we found that there were significantly higher gains for children who participated in return to learning compared to their peers who did not. These results are all preliminary and further study is definitely needed to identify the learning outcomes, but this gives an example of how we can use data generated within return to learning to support children's reintegration into the classroom. I'll now turn the presentation to Tariq Daud, who will be uh, speaking specifically on how we use data to enhance learning with facilitators in data-driven dashboards uh, drawing on HALDO data. Tariq? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, good evening, good morning, everyone. Uh, so the system uh, was uh, built on uh, an ODK collect, which is a data collection uh, tool linked to Power BI, uh, which is a, a dashboard. Uh, actually, uh, after uh, after having uh, this uh, link, uh, we had four main uh, uh, components uh, of uh, of the dashboard. Uh, as you know, the dashboards actually used for uh, analytics. Uh, so, and uh, we've been able to use Power BI for for uh, analytics. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, the the basic, the major uh, main uh, page of of, uh, of uh, the dashboard, where we have uh, actually four main components. We have a general page, 
we have a literacy outcome page, numeracy outcome page, and a social and emotional learning uh, outcome uh, page. Uh, data have been uh, disaggregated uh, by gender, age, uh, and uh, the center where the implementation uh, took place, uh, in addition to the average score. Uh, in addition uh, to that, uh, especially for the literacy, numeracy, and uh, social and emotional learning pages, uh, we had uh, uh, the skill, uh, skill level, uh, in addition to the activities that's supposed to be uh, conducted and implemented uh, for every single, uh, single group. Uh, this uh, approach, which is linking uh, data uh, ODK uh, collect with Power BI, uh, actually served our uh, field teams and program, uh, especially education program team, who've been implementing uh, this approach. Uh, it provides actually a real, uh, real time uh, data uh, for the team, which is very essential uh, in order to identify the needs uh, per each group, per uh, each center. And that allowed a decision, uh, I, I can say an accurate decision making based on a scientific approach, uh, which is considered to be a data driven approach. And uh, actually it supported the classrooms uh, by enhancing uh, the instruction and enhancing the plans uh, within, uh, within classrooms. Uh, moreover, it enabled our teams to compare differences among groups and take uh, progress and, that, uh, and to take uh, to track uh, the progress uh, within uh, within those uh, those served uh, groups, uh, and finally, uh, also as a major uh, impact of uh, such uh, a system, we've been able uh, to communicate uh, our results. And here, I uh, I will ask James to continue since I'm ending with uh, communicating results and how and we can see how this communication helped later on uh, within our implementation. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Tarek. Um, so, yep, so today I'll be picking up and talking about how we kind of translate data from, uh, from our programs and from our research into advocacy and into policy change, looking at uh, top line messaging um, and advocacy asks, advocacy around refugee education, and lastly, a little bit on advocacy around um, durable solutions. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Great. So, um, yeah, messaging and asks. So, in advocacy, data can be used to ground messaging uh, in a sort of objectivity, and it can also be used to frame arguments. We have this figure. We know that more than half of the 25.9 uh, million refugees in the world are children. So this is really useful for just getting us involved in the conversation. Um, too often, children's needs can get sidelined and underfunded in refugees' responses. Um, so this kind of big top-line messaging implies uh, that a, a child-sensitive lens is relevant in most any intervention uh, regarding refugees. It, it helps us get a seat at the table, basically. Uh, we also have data um, as an advocacy ask. It is a real regular ask for us, uh, ideally disaggregated by age, sex, and disability, as long as uh, appropriate uh, data protection and data sharing systems and guidelines are in place. So why is data an advocacy ask for us? And it's, well, because uh, so much data is often child blind. Um, a good case in point is a situation of IDPs. Uh, so it's very difficult to find out how many IDPs there are in the world. UNICEF uh, recently released an estimate of 19 million IDP children. Um, and that's the best I've seen, but even they acknowledge that the data is very difficult to come by. Um, in any case, the lack of disaggregated data makes it difficult to identify the specific needs of children, and that complicates programming, it complicates advocacy, and it complicates funding and planning, among other things. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, refugee education advocacy. Um, so data definitely helps us make a strong case for refugee education. As you can see in the quote um, on the page, Save the Children found children are more than twice as likely, uh, in, to, uh, the children in emergency, humanitarian emergency situations are more than twice as likely to rank going to school as their top concern um, ahead of, you know, things like uh, wash and nutrition and, um, Healthcare, so it's it's really quite um, 
quite an important ask from refugee children. But still, education makes up about 3% of the global humanitarian budget. Um, so how is this data useful? Uh, um, well, first off, because the participants are children themselves, it's useful in elevating um, their distinctness and wants. Uh, it also helps us make a case that education is life-saving, or at the very least, it's as important and often more desired by children as other interventions understood to be life-saving. Um, and also, by comparing these wants and needs with the global humanitarian budget, uh, we can advocate at all levels. So it works in, it's useful in host countries, it's useful in donor countries, and it's useful at the global level. Uh, and this was particularly useful around the global refugee forum. Um, I can get into uh, maybe the targeting next. If you could switch to the next side, please, and we'll talk about durable solutions. Uh, so we're in the middle of returns for a shift in global politics. Um, with returns being emphasized over uh, local integration and resettlement. Uh, and despite lacking even baseline data, the information available raises questions about the durability of these returns. Uh, our Migration and Displacement Initiative compiled this data and developed a child-specific indicator framework. Um, and it not only does it take legal, physical, and material safety as an important point, it adds mental health and psychosocial well-being. And really importantly, link them to obligations laid out in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, so it's legal binding. And we found this framework to be particularly useful in recent advocacy around consultations for the World Bank's Refugee Policy Review Framework, which would help to guide uh, the distribution of Ida-19 funding. Um, it's been very useful in kind of working to expand the framework's uh, child sensitivity. Um, next slide, please. And this is just simply an overview of uh, return to learnings uses. Um, you can see there. Um, and that is all. So next slide, please. Great. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, um, uh, Alison, James, and Tarek. Um, and we'll go straight over to our third uh, presentation today, which is uh, Anra uh, and Helena Fouad and Mohammed. So over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, Honorable our presentation is Abir. I share it. Stuart, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think it's just uh, coming. We're seeing a, a gray screen at the moment. Can you try going to full screen again? Okay, we can see it now. Now? Yes, that's great. We can see it. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the GBE team to give us the opportunity in Norwa to present ourselves here. Uh, at the beginning, I would like to uh, thank my colleagues, Helena, Mohammed, and I will present uh, Onorwa in this. Uh, we will talk about assessing equity and inclusion, inclusion in a Norway education program. And we will uh, look briefly on uh, M&E approaches in the COVID-19 context. At the beginning, uh, I think uh, it's good to uh, talk briefly uh, about Onorwa. 
for 70 years, UNRWA has worked to ensure the Palestine refugee children have access to quality, inclusive, and equitable education. Um, apologies, Fuad, uh, just to, can you try to oh, uh, put it on full screen again? It's now showing the whole PowerPoint. Okay. That's good, thank you. Okay. Uh, some figures about uh, UNRWA. Uh, we have 533,000 342 Palestinian refugee children and 22,000 education staff in 790 schools in five fields, West Bank, Gaza, Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. Also, we have eight vocational training centers for 8,270 youth. Norway education program was born of conflict and operated through a number of conflicts with a renowned education in emergency program and most recently it's COVID-19 education in emergency approach. In general, UNRWA education monitoring and evaluation uh, linked to programmatic objectives. Here, for UNRWA education program, it's absolutely critical that our monitoring and evaluation system are linked to our programmatic ob objectives and that we measure what matter. Also, we see monitoring, evaluation, and program delivery as feeding into one another. We design monitoring evaluation approaches to measure the extent to which we are meeting objectives. We refine programmatic approaches according to what we learn from monitoring and evaluation, and so on. Apologies, Fuad, can you go to full screen again? So it's a bit small when it's showing the whole PowerPoint. This one. I share it. Okay. Helena, it's severe. I just think you can't open the PowerPoint so that they can, everyone can see the full uh, power, the full screen. Okay. It's a beer now, Helena. Yes, it's good. It's good. Okay. Also, monitoring and evaluation, we use it as a tool for ownership and engagement with all stakeholders across the organization. Different tools for different purposes. Indicators may be, may, may be collected quarterly, annual, triannual, and the findings are drawn from a range of, of qualitative and quantitative resources. Also, we have agency-wide studies. Maybe if there is a time, we can talk about them. Regarding to disaggregation for factors, key indicators are disaggregated by both gender and dis disability, because these two main factors are very important. Besides these two main factors, we also collect, uh, disaggregate the data regarding uh, age, regarding uh, stage of study, grade, and it, et cetera. Now, I will give the chance to my colleague, Helena, to talk about uh, more about details for uh, indicators and our monitoring evaluation approach in general. Go ahead, Irina, please. Thanks so much, Fuad. Um, let me just check everyone can hear me and my video is showing okay. Hello? Fuad, can you? I'm hoping it's working. Anyway, I'll yes, just Yes, we can hear you. I hear you, Irina. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Um, as Fuad mentioned, our ME approach is linked to our programmatic objectives. So our overall 
objective for basic education being what we call strategic outcome three, that school uh, age children complete quality, equity, and inclusive basic education. And I should highlight here that we also have a TVET program, but for the sake of time, we'll focus today on our basic education program covering grades uh, one to 10. Uh, so in UNRWA, we have a holistic approach to achieving uh, equity and inclusion and to measuring it. So what matters, we will measure, and we only measure what we have made efforts to bring about, to do, or to change. Uh, this slide uh, is highlighting our key indicators related to equity and inclusion specifically. Uh, so if, as you can see under the main strategic outcome here, we have some retention related indicators which are measured through our student level data in our EMIS system. Um, indicators such as cumulative dropout rate, survival rate, and coefficient of internal efficiency. And you may notice these are the same ones used in many education systems globally, uh, according to UNESCO standards. And, and this is because external comparability is very important to us here. Um, under strategic outcome three, we also have key outputs directly highlighting how we're doing on inclusion and equity. Um, these are main, uh, mentioned measured using a range of indicators and sources, as Fuad said. So in addition to student level data from the MS system, which, which captures the retention indicators and issues such as support for students with disabilities and needs, uh, we also have rich data sources in the form of our agency-wide research studies every three to four years. Um, so for example, we have an indicator on the degree to which inclusive approaches are embedded in educational practice. This is measured actually through our classroom observation study. Um, we have an indicator on the gap in student performance, which allows us to track um, the gap in learning outcomes between our lower and higher performing students. This is through the monitoring of learning assessment tests, which were actually mentioned in one of the previous presentations. We also have indicators based on input directly from beneficiaries through our perceptional surveys with students, parents, teachers, and school principals. Um, so for example, the degree to which schools are violence-free, which is tracked through our perceptional survey with students. Uh, Fuad, if you can move to the next slide. And let me just check, is my video working, Fuad? Yes, okay, it's fine. Okay, great, okay, good. Um, so as mentioned at the outset, there's a continual need to measure all that we do. And when the context demands that we do things differently, that means we have to measure things differently. Um, so uh, as UNRWA, as an agency working in a conflict context, we've developed an education and emergencies approach which built on the broader uh, education program to ensure continued education provision when children are impacted by crises. Um, and to this end, the EIE Bank of Indicators was launched in November, actually of last year, to provide a, a set of common measurement tools which our fields can draw from according to their changing and uh, diverse needs. And this covers all of the key strands of our EIE approach. So this includes access to education, safe and secure learning environments, the psychosocial well-being of students, quality uh, teaching and learning, parent and community engagement, and we also have a, a range of cross-cutting indicators. Slide. Um, just following this, uh, COVID-19 has presented a new type of emergency context for UNRWA. Um, but because we have our pre-existing EIE approach, we've been able to react quickly, building on this approach. Um, as in past emergencies, continuity of learning is a key pillar. And for this, we have a wide range of resources which have been deployed, uh, including our pre-existing resources such as UNRWA TV, our interactive learning program, as well as newly developed wraparound guidance uh, for students' use of textbooks, uh, which they fortunately have at the home. We've also developed guidelines for teachers and parents on using self-learning materials, and we're ensuring that there are systems of student support in place, such as through uh, WhatsApp groups at the school level. Uh, meanwhile, activating structures in our system, such as our PTAs, to support dissemination of self-learning materials and ensuring that students are able to use them. Another key strand of work here, uh, as in prior emergencies, has been psychosocial support. So, for example, um, to deal with what's been called the infodemic associated with COVID-19, the team here at UNRWA has developed a resource guide uh, to highlight some of the most relevant resources in our context. Um, I should mention that we, we view the self-learning uh, itself as a form of psychological support by engaging students in a positive way, um, and we've worked to increasingly integrate positive uh, PSS messages into the materials themselves. 
There's also been an agency-wide uh, PSS working group formed. And then in the last strand mentioned here, uh, around which is typically our safety and security strand, this has now been adapted in this new context to focus more on health. And with this, we have a range of awareness activities as well as prevention efforts uh, with regards to hygiene materials for the schools, uh, disinfection, et cetera. So this diagram here outlines some of the key M&E activities that we're undertaking to address uh, our need in this new context. Um, for UNRWA, student access to learning from home, I would say it's been the biggest issue of concern since the outset of this crisis. Um, and so we have a number of ME efforts focused on this. Uh, we are just now completing a set of parent phone surveys in each field to assess technological access. And um, our colleague Mohammed will describe this uh, given his experience in the West Bank in more detail. We've also developed a new indicator for our uh, EIE bank of indicators. And this is for another way of looking at student access using school reported data. So the, the work on the EIE bank is, is continuing and we're adapting this in the new context. Simultaneously, we're looking into technology. Um, we're drawing on support from our information management and technology department to review the tools we have to, to see, you know, if those are really the, the best tools for our purposes now and reviewing global evidence uh, from similar contexts to see how we can enhance our use of technology. Um, another key information need that we've, we've, we've identified is to really understand the nature of teacher support in this context. Um, and for this, we're also using phone-based approaches uh, because this is a good way to reach people uh, even when online access is very dependent person to person and area to area. At the bottom of this diagram, I'll highlight is that while we're learning about our response and, and evaluating how we're doing, we are now learning about ME itself. What approaches work best as our contexts are shifting? Um, and for example, with the EIE Bank of Indicators, originally a lot of those indicators were designed to address uh, issues related to conflict, but they're still relevant uh, in a health emergency and we're adapting some of those indicators to suit these purposes. Um, next slide, please. And so uh, as shown in the diagram, our questions of equity have been our main priority so far in our COVID-19 response. What kind of access to technologies do students have at home? How many students are accessing our self-learning materials? And critically, which students are not able to benefit from self-learning? Uh, this information, as we've stated all along in the presentation, this is linked to our programmatic work. So this can inform our planning for catch-up programs, school reopening, school reopening, and optimizing our use of technology. With that, I'll hand it over to Mohammed to talk a bit about uh, the work in the West Bank uh, with the phone survey specifically. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Helene. I will uh, start uh, just from you, uh, finish about the experiment of uh, West Bank field office in uh, um, the uh, parent uh, phone survey. Um, uh, UNARWA uh, developed a questionnaire to survey the views of the parents, students in the West Bank about their awareness, access, and use of Norwa self learning materials. Uh, uh, this survey aim at ensuring that self learning program achieves its goals and at getting to know parents and children's view about uh, this, ser uh, this service provided to them. Uh, this phone survey is, uh, is to address the issue of equity and inclusion, both in topic and methods. I mean by topics that investigating access to technology and self-learning materials among students. And when we're talking about method, uh, uh, I mean using phone-based approach, since we can reach a much uh, a broader population um, as we have phone numbers available for more than 90% of our students through our MS system. The methodology used in, 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 in this survey is uh, we uh, uh, have assembled representative of UNARWA school in West Bank around 30% uh, and uh, we uh, easy uh, uh, random sampling of a student, choose student number 10 from every class section and that way was very simple and very direct to the school principals who are doing the phone survey and when when the uh, number uh, the student number 10 in the class section is unavailable for any reason 
they are moving to the next one, number 11 or 12, and uh, etc. The phone based approach does not exclude any student with any internet connection barriers. And the survey administrated by school principals. Why this approach? Because the school principals are very familiar with their communities and uh, they are able to reach families when phone numbers uh, are unavailable, unavailable or uh, 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 inaccurate. Uh, in addition, that uh, the school principals, this approach were, uh, was strengthening the school uh, with uh, the family relationship. Now, uh, after uh, we completed this survey, we uh, uh, reached uh, the parents of 280 uh, students. Now, this survey is uh, uh, developed in, in fully cooperation with uh, between HQ and the fields when we're developing it and the methodology, uh, not only the questionnaire, but also the methodology. The data is uh, comparable with other four uh, with the other four fields, but with additional question customized for West Bank context. Uh, we have developed and piloted the survey in a sample of a school from a uh, different environment, I mean outside or inside camps, uh, and then we implemented it on a sample of approximately 30% of the total school in the field. The first reading of the result indicates that, for example, more than 70% of parents reported that their children were able to access uh, the internet. Now, uh, we will benefit from the result in 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 will planning for the catch up month for uh, of uh, August, in in order to ensure that the quality of the service provided in integrating face to face learning with self learning approach. And how will we strengthen the self learning approach in our school when we have all these data and challenges are identified? The key uh, question on this survey was about the availability of service and frequently of childhood and internet connectivity and the student use of an our self-learning uh, materials. Thank you, and I hand it to my colleagues, Helena, if there is anything. Sure, thank you so much, Mohammed. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just go quite briefly through this last slide here, um, just to reinforce a few points. Um, that for UNRWA, uh, equity and inclusion is extremely important to us, core to strategic outcome three. And one element of this is using equitable, inclusive methods in terms of how we collect our data. So that's why we've been using more and more uh, phone-based data collection approaches, because this is physically safe, not spreading any COVID, but we're also able to reach a broad uh, population and not miss out on some of the most vulnerable children. Um, we're using monitoring and evaluation to learn about our programmatic objectives and how we're doing against those. But meanwhile, we're also learning about ME itself and continually improving our approaches as we learn. Uh, and as Mohammed emphasized, we're collaborating um, upwards, downwards, and sideways. Fields are testing new approaches. Uh, we are highlighting them and, and supporting harmonization across all of our fields. We're working at multiple levels um, and fields are learning from one another. Uh, so we could say so much more, but in the interest of time and to move forward to the discussion, I'll stop here and want to thank everyone very much for the opportunity. Maybe, maybe Helena, because the MLA was mentioned in uh, one of the presentations, maybe if we have a time, we can uh, two minutes talk about our agency-wide studies in general, Stuart. What do you think? Um, in the interest of time, can I suggest that uh, we move on to the discussion? Um, and um, we can share these resources afterwards, and it's possible that it, it can come up in the uh, in the discussion. Um, it, uh, it's very uh, interesting content, but I, I think we better move on to, to give some time to people's questions. If that's okay. Right. Okay. So okay. Okay. So thank you very much to all of our presenters. Some really uh, fascinating presentations there. Um, and uh, we're now going to uh, go to. Um, to Anne Smiley of uh, INEE and FHI 360 uh, to give her response to uh, the presentations. Anne. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, can we can me? hear you. Okay, great. 
Um, I want to just start off by saying thank you so much to GPE for organizing this um, and to the presenters, three wonderful presentations. We've had the opportunity to see uh, a mapping of the learning assessment landscape in the EIE setting, followed by a couple of really high quality concrete examples of what agencies are doing to adapt their assessment strategies for education and emergencies context, including I'm really, really excited to see the COVID-19 crisis context. Um, so I'm here, as mentioned, representing INEE. Um, and that as I'm not a member of the Secretariat, but I'm here representing um, several of INEE's working groups and work streams around data and evidence and monitoring and evaluation. And uh, I can say for a fact that there is a sector wide desire to go beyond access to measuring impact and outcomes and equity uh, in all of our education and emergencies programming and policies and to move towards more evidence based programming. Uh, a couple of comments on the presentation. So Kate's presentation um, on the learning assessment mapping really made me realize that, and I, I, mean, I think we all already know this, but that data systems and assessments in education and emergencies context really do need to look different. We need to think differently about them. They need to be more flexible. They need to be able to reach those populations that are really difficult to reach, including IDPs, including refugees. We need to probably be measuring different things. So not only looking at our traditional academic learning outcomes, but also looking at social emotional learning and other aspects of equity and inclusion that we may not always include in some of our other uh, monitoring tools. We need to be careful not to add a burden of stress to kids who are already stressed. We need to make sure to capture those background characteristics so that we can really look at equity. And we need to think a lot about ethical issues. Uh, and that includes these issues around capturing the legal status of IDPs uh, uh, and refugees and other populations uh, who are on the move. Um, the second presentation on Haldo I found to be really interesting and I think it's such a great approach. Um, I wanted to make a couple of comments about um, the, the importance of the use of this kind of data. So the dashboard that Tarek presented, that's a really important step forward, I think, for the field in terms of thinking about not only how we collect the data, what it looks like, how we adapt to these, uh, these different challenging contexts that we're working in, but also how we put together these dashboards and these other um, utilization-oriented approaches to, uh, to our data uh, collection platforms. Um, how do we do that, though, not only within projects and within agencies, but also working to build the capacity of governments to be able to collect and use uh, EIE uh, data more effectively and um, potentially learning assessment data as well? So that's a question that I posed to the, to the group. Um, the third presentation from UNRWA, uh, it just strikes me what a model system can look like um, and what as a community can we learn from UNRWA's commitment to, uh, to improving uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, across the agency. And um, it's really impressive what has been done um, agency-wide in terms of uh, standard monitoring and evaluation for, uh, for the programs and for education and emergencies in general um, within UNRWA's programming, but also in the context of COVID-19. So what can we as a community learn from UNRWA's approaches? I know that UNRWA is a specific case quite different from many of the other contexts where we work, but what can we learn from this collective commitment to improving um, access and use of high quality education and emergency data, particularly around equity and inclusion? Uh, so really, really impressive. I know I'm just about out of time, but um, I really wanna quickly mention a couple of things that INEE is doing. And we had a, just about a year ago, INEE held a data summit to talk about education emergencies data. And some of the key outcomes of that summit were that we need to do a better job of connecting global initiatives around uh, quality learning and equity outcomes. So who's doing what, how can we all come together and make sure that we're um, synergizing and joining forces. And I wanna just say that INEE is working on that and trying to figure out how we can build better synergy across these different platforms. We also need to advocate for better data sharing. We know that as a community, we're not the best when it comes to sharing data and we need to work on that. We've formed an education and emergencies data reference group within INEE to start moving that work forward. And we're also working on an ethics brief on education and emergencies data specifically. 
Um, we also need to advocate for senior leadership within organizations to prioritize capacity building on education emergencies data, including learning assessments, how to collect better data and how to use it uh, to inform better programming and policies. Um, I think capacity building is still a major gap across agencies and across government and across institutions. And um, yeah, we need to make sure that we're not duplicating efforts. Um, there are, there's a, a four or five different work streams within IEEE focusing on this right now, including a new measurement tool library, a quality and equitable learning outcomes work stream, a monitoring and evaluation work stream, uh, data and evidence collaborative. Um, we also, I also work on the education equity research initiative, and we've worked on some indicator work around how do we improve indicators for equity in education emergencies. And we, we have a task team on teacher well-being and measurement around teacher well-being. And, um, and actually within a program that I lead, a USAID program, the Middle East Education Research Training and Support Program, we're actually doing a study right now on, on IDP and education data and how we can better collect data within IDP populations on education and improve our understanding of what's happening there. That was mentioned by our colleague from Save the Children as a gap, and we've also found that to be a gap. So I'm gonna wrap up with that and um, we can turn back, uh, I think we can turn back to the Q&A now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Annie, for some really uh, stimulating comments there. Um, I, um, maybe I'll turn back to the uh, Save the Children and Haldo group um, just to uh, see if you have any initial response to Annie's uh, comments. And particularly, um, she asked uh, about um, how we can actually improve capacity of governments to run learning assessments, um, especially in um, emergency situations. And uh, there was also kind of a point uh, about the UNRWA um, uh, system and what can we learn from UNRWA's and in, in that situation, the collective commitment to improving um, access and use of high quality data uh, and particularly with equity and inclusion. So maybe we could turn that to, to the Save the Children group as well. Do you have any reflections on the UNRWA model and how uh, that model may, may influence your own programming? Uh, this is Ali. I can jump in. In terms of thinking about the working with governments using the data and dashboards, to Annie's point, um, we do have some experience uh, not with Haldo data, but with Acer data of working with ministry officials both to engage in data collection as well as talking about how to use data um, that is from a different context um, and program. But I think it's a good example of how we can really be building capacity. Um, at a national level using data um, in emergency settings. In the Return to Learning program, because we're looking at really a bridging program for children who are out of school, it, it goes to what James talked about at the top line of understanding the demographics, the um, what needs are in the context uh, for out of school children. In one instance in Uganda, I know we found that um, the language diversity in the context was uh, significantly higher than we had originally anticipated with uh, more like 23 languages in one um, displacement environment. So that sort of information I think can also be particularly useful um, at the national level to understand what the needs are. Uh, Tarek and uh, James, do you have anything to add on that or comments on the, the UNRWA model? Um, just to quickly respond um, to uh, to Anne Smiley's uh, question, I, I unfortunately don't have much to add to the UNRWA uh, model, but on that, uh, also just for building better um, capacity, I think that would also come down to uh, development partners and humanitarian partners working with um, governments. Um, uh, and there's something for civil society in that as well. I mean, I think we should be encouraging uh, UNHCR, for example, uh, to uh, work with governments to gather better data and better information. Um. Uh, yes, from my side, also just uh, 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 another experience uh, using data in order to uh, using data for uh, decision making in uh, within, within the Ministry of Education. 
Lebanon, actually, uh, we had experience uh, supporting the Ministry of uh, Education in a GIS uh, system and uh, GIS uh, staff, uh, GIS, which is uh, the geographical information uh, system. And actually, the Ministry of Education here in Lebanon benefited a lot uh, from that system for decision making. And initially, we uh, our main aim was to support the Ministry of Education and then the government of Lebanon, since that system provides maps, uh, exact location of the schools, uh, main information, they started to use that system to uh, identify schools for needs of rehabilitation, schools that can accept uh, students with disabilities, uh, uh, to figure uh, the number of children, number of classes. So actually, uh, using data and decision making is uh, a huge, uh, contribution and uh, actually within education it can benefit a lot uh, ministry of ministries and uh, governments uh, in addition to organizations quickly going to the UNRWA point um the model specifically around you know common indicators is something that we definitely are you know interested in and doing a lot of common indicator work in education and emergencies and I think what was really fascinating to me in that presentation was looking at that COVID-19 response piece. So one of the things we have been thinking about in terms of how to measure learning remotely is looking at that perception survey um, that the, the team discussed on there. Um, this very nice slide I'm looking at about the student access role of technology and self-learning provision. And so I'm interested in, in learning more about UNRWA's work on that and then thinking about how we can really be assessing learning um, at the home level. Great, okay, thanks uh, for those comments. Perhaps following up on this um, point about the, the, the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic situation, uh, and UNRWA, um, the UNRWA team did show this uh, very interesting slide about m &E during the COVID-19 response. I wonder if the UNRWA team can come back and talk a bit more about um, how you've maintained uh, enough priority, um, maintain the, the collection of data and um, collection of learning information and this, including our marginalized groups and equity as a priority amidst the crisis situation where the focus might be shifting to other things. And um, there was also a question uh, closely related to that about how can we get the maximum information on learning in this situation, how do we assure the maximum response rates during the uh, during the pandemic? So, so would someone from the UNRWA team like to come back on those on those points? Um, I can jump in on the uh, maintaining data collection. Um, so, yes, during this crisis, our data collection on our main uh, indicators for the medium-term strategy is continuing. And one of the advantages we have is from our education management information system which you know, our staff can access from, uh, with their logins uh, from a web browser. Um, and this is allowing us to continue to input data and be able to see what's going on. Um, and we're still fine tuning those access issues, but it's a great starting point for us. And I will mention something I didn't get a chance to say about um, looking ahead in terms of, of, of uh, monitoring on COVID-19 is the issue of dropout. So, while, the mon while uh, we have retention indicators like dropout rates and repetition rates are a key part of our strategy, uh, since there's been so much uh, discussion uh, globally around the potential impact of COVID-19 and dropout, we're actually looking into ways we can enhance our dropout data collection even further, potentially to gather, gather more uh, detailed data about dropout, you know, not just the figures and the numbers, uh, which we already do have and we disaggregate, but seeing if there are ways we can gather more information about dropout, maybe at a, a shorter time scale or reasons for dropout. Um, and I had noted in one of the earlier presentations, the, the mention of the SDGs and how, you know, there could be more diseg dis disaggregation by even more factors such as conflict affected. So maybe with the COVID-19 crisis, one of the things that people can start monitoring is how uh, COVID-19 is impacting and, and, and if areas of where there are more or less school closures, we see different patterns. So um, there's also the issue of where we do have key indicators, kind of deepening and enriching our focus on those issues. Okay. May I add, Helena? Of course, of course, yes, over to you. 
Okay. Hello. Regarding uh, the high response rate uh, in general in our studies, in our surveys, hello, uh, everything at ONORWA uh, is built uh, with cooperation with five fields. Hello. We have a system. Uh, after uh, 2010, we have education reform. Uh, uh, the major benefit of this reform was you know, everything is done at ONORWA will be shared with five fields. So we are talk with our colleagues in the fields because of commitment of our colleagues in the fields, and we choose the suitable methodology to collect the data. For example, for one survey that our colleague Mohammed from West Bank was talking about, uh, we use the phone methodology because we know that if we make uh, an online survey, it will not, uh, uh, and it will not achieve our goals and our objectives. And we discuss with our colleagues in the field how we can collect the data by using phone. And we prepare Google phone to collect the data to make uh, collecting the data for school principal is easy. And we receive the data, and now we are working on analysis of data. But I think commitment of our colleagues in five fields, uh, also we have a research strategy that was built with reform. Uh, all of these issues uh, always make a, a response rate for our surveyors, uh, surveys and the study is very high. Over. Okay, uh, thank you very much for those responses. Um, maybe um, I would like to add a question now um, around uh, disability. So we've seen in uh, our presentations that um, uh, they, these exercises are generally able to provide some kind of disaggregation by um, uh, including in some cases by disability. But I wondered, um, uh, Kate, in your uh, mapping exercise, have you come across uh, the approaches that they've used to adapting tests for children with different impairments um, and whether th those approaches uh, have been used in, um, in, in different emergency contexts? Um. Thanks, Stuart. Um, we we saw s several promising examples um, and um, around um, some of the citizen-led assessments have um, have used adaptations for um, well, first of all, oral assessments, um, but then also for children um, who have vision impairments. There's been some adaptations there. Um, but um, it's not, um, we, we didn't find kind of any, any widespread efforts um, for adaptation. And a lot of um, studies, um, again, if, you know, if you're looking at national, nationally representative studies um, using a standardized test, um, a lot of times um, those studies will exclude children with disabilities, um, not always, but, but in some cases, um, in order to, um, as the tools were not um, validated on those populations. Um, so it's another kind of level of exclusion that can happen. Okay, um, thanks for that. Um, maybe I'll just turn one um, more question back to the Save the Children team. Um, so we had a question on the, on the live chat. Um, is it possible to track a skill and progress by a whole subgroup, for example, students studying in a second language. Um, and there was kind of a related question from um, IEI Pakistan, which was about whether the tool facilitates assessment of English skills in, in English as a foreign language environment. Could, so could you talk a bit about those language issues in your, in your test? I can speak a little bit about the um, grouping and the language Questions. So, in terms of tracking children's school and progress by like subgroups such as children who um, English is a second language, 
um, children by various refugee status, et cetera, whatever is identified as relevant at the context, uh, in the contextualization, it depends on the sample size. So if we have a large population of children who are second, uh, English is their second language, um, and we want to disaggregate by that, then we just need to think about how we would be able to measure uh, in a comparative way. And this also is a, an issue when we're looking at disaggregating by disability, um, is identifying a large enough sample that we would be able to make any claims um, about differences in equity or changes over time for children in these particular groupings. And then in terms of as a tool that measure for measuring children, um, who English is not their first language and English is perhaps the language of instruction. The way we do this is that the literacy section includes um, literacy at the uh, expressive vocabulary, which can be done in the mother tongue. Um, but when it comes to the reading passage and comprehension, we're actually looking at the language of instruction. So we're measuring whether or not the child is, again, going to the school readiness piece, is able to understand uh, the language of instruction, which may or may not be English, for example. Um, and so in that way, we can look at uh, how children's language and mother tongue may be interacting with their um, outcome scores both on holo and then their, their uh, experience in the classroom. I think one of the things that we found is a gap in Holdo and that we're seeking to uh, address in future iterations is about oral language comprehension um, in the mother tongue as well as in the language of instruction. And so that would have to be another piece that would be added um, in addition to what we already have on the language of instruction questions. But I wouldn't say that Holdo is a tool for measuring um, specifically uh, English as a second language learners. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, and um, we are coming towards the end of our allotted time now. So um, I'd like just again to, to thank all of our presenters very much. I think it's been a really fascinating set of presentations. Um, thank you to everyone who's been um, who's been watching, and especially to everyone who's been asking questions um, for our presenters through the YouTube chat box. And I'm sorry that we haven't had time to get to all of uh, the questions which have been there, um, but we will be circulating these questions to the presenters after the session uh, and inviting them to give responses, which will circulate to everyone who is registered as a participant in this session. Uh, once again, if you want more information, uh, you can write to us at webinars at uh, globalpartnership.org. Um, so just to sum up a little bit, I think we've seen um, both some of the challenges around learning assessments in crisis uh, situations, but also um, that it is possible to carry out these learning assessments and to do so in a way which is um, uh, rigorous and, and adheres to quality standards. Uh, and also that it's essential to do this for understanding the equity and marginalization issues in terms of learning outcomes. Um, and um, we have seen, I think, that it's important to be able to learn from some of these existing responses for the COVID-19 response, the various distance learning and other programs that are going on at the moment to try and ensure learning continuity. Uh, even though there are some unique challenges around these um, and unique challenges in the ability to assess learning during this uh, pandemic, um, there are definitely some um, implications we can take away from the existing programs in this. Uh, and uh, important clearly for us to keep iterating on these um, approaches. Um, in terms of uh, inclusion of all groups, including the children who are out of school, um, where many of the assessments continue to focus on children who are in school or in some form of education provision, on adapting tests for children with different disabilities, uh, and for adapting them to different language groups. So all um, aspects that we've seen we need to keep working on in order to improve the inclusiveness of these assessments and make sure that we're really capturing all of the information that uh, policymakers and people designing programs need to um, uh, to understand uh, learning outcomes, understand the impact and effectiveness of their programs, um, and to continue to improve them. So with that, thank you very much again to all of our presenters and uh, participants, uh, and we'll end the session here.
Thank you, Stuart and GBE team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs>